Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I thought I would speak uh, not about the genesis of my book, but really about the genesis of this uh, particular talk. I um, was giving a talk on, on my work, my, my scientific work on cancer, about uh, two weeks, three weeks ago, um, and I just stepped off the podium when a woman um, who had a history of breast cancer uh, and the BRCA1 mutation, um, the genetic history of breast cancer that had run through her family, um, she confronted me and she said, can I eliminate this mutation from my family forever? Um, what would I, what would you do, what would happen if I could change um, the future lineage of, um, of my family so that my children would never have to face the kinds of crises I faced in my life? She, was, she had breast cancer herself. So um, that's the question I want to take up a little bit. It's the end of, the, the question really occurs at the end of the book, of the gene, um, in the last uh, section of the gene. Um, and, and I'd like to begin by, um, by reminding us um, that if, let's say, your genome um, was printed on a, in a book format um, with the letters ACTG, um, and it was printed like a book, it would be 70 full volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. So every edge of this room and flowing into the next room would be lined with, um, with one person's genome printed ACTGC. CCT like this, and you'd come into, and, and you'd in, you could inhabit your own genome. Um, and the question that, that, that this woman was asking was an interesting question, which is, what can we read now from that encyclopedia? How much of that encyclopedia is readable? And the second question is, what if we learn to write instructions into the encyclopedia? What if I could say, go to volume 317, um, over in that corner, and erase one word, uh, maybe that word specifies the gene for BRCA1, and substitute the corrected word in its place. Um, so, so this capacity to read and write information um, is, 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 of course, gets to the question of who we are. Um, and, and that's the question that the last half of, of, the, of, the, of the gene raises. Uh, these are not abstract questions for me, um, because as I described in the first part of the book, my own family has a striking history of genetic illness um, in the form of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, as I speak, I have um, a one cousin who is institutionalized uh, permanently in Calcutta for, um, uh, for his schizophrenia. And so um, this is not an abstraction for me. When we learn to read and write information about our genomes, uh, what will happen to our capacity to understand illnesses such as schizophrenia, mental illness, breast cancer, and other illnesses. Um, so um, I want to take a little bit of a journey through that, through that story, this reading and writing story, and end up um, asking some uh, hopefully provocative questions about how to enter this, how, how we're going to enter this conversation as we move forward. Uh, many of you know that the, as far as reading is concerned, the draft sequence of the human genome was published in 2001. And by the draft sequence, that really means that we now have a template uh, along which we can essentially uh, read um, virtually every part of every individual's genome. It, the, the costs have come down strikingly. To read the active parts of, of a single human genome was, you know, what would, would used to take on the order of several million to a, nearly a billion dollars. Now, to read the active parts of a human genome, um, it takes about a thousand dollars per person. And that cost will come down even more, maybe a by a factor of 10. Um, so, we, we've acquired the capacity to read the genome. And just to remind ourselves, one of the things that's told, one of the things that's told us is that the difference between you and you um, really amounts to maybe less than one of those volumes of the encyclopedia. The difference between you and your sibling who has, the relevant difference between you and your sibling who may have a lethal disease, um, such as cystic fibrosis, may be three or four letters in that, in that encyclopedia. The relevant difference between you and, and, and a patient with Huntington's disease who will surely die of Huntington's disease is maybe one page. And, and here's what's important, in, in, in a time when, when, the, when the word race has overtaken our culture um, and, and dominated politics, the difference between you and anyone else from the, or of another so-called human race may be four or five pages or six pages 
of that entire Encyclopedia Britannica. It's just a reminder of to have some humility about the about how much what the genome is telling us about human beings. Um, uh, so, so this was this was what had happened by the 2000s in terms of reading uh, genomes, and and by the, um, by, by, the, by the 1990s, we were also beginning to put ge genetic information into uh, uh, human genomes. This is Jesse Gelsinger. Um, he was one of the first uh, children um, on whom gene therapy was attempted, an attempt to put a foreign gene into his body. Um, but sadly, he died of that. Of that, uh, he was uh, one of the first deaths from gene therapy. So it was a reminder by the by the late 1990s that although we had learned so much about the human genome, there was yet much to learn. Um, so um, by in about a decade um, since that time, uh, two new questions, two new frontiers have come about, and this really changes the stakes of what we can and cannot do. Um, and that is that we are now entering a new world. One of them is that we're reading the genome before the embryo or egg is implanted. Um, that changes the stakes because all of a sudden, rather than waiting to read it as an adult, you can make a decision whether to implant or not implant an embryo based on what, 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 the, what the genetic sequence is. So to go back to this woman with the breast cancer mutation, um, she could, in principle, the scientific technology exists in her case, she could choose to not implant um, an egg or an embryo which carried that mutation. That scientific, we are already there. That, that technology already exists. And again, going back to Jesse Gelsinger as a, as a, as a different example, um, you know, in his case, um, the, the genetic information was, in, it, it was placed inside cells of his body, but that couldn't be transmitted to his child or his child's child. Um, but now um, we can be, we're beginning to invent technologies in the last five years where we can introduce genetic changes before the making of sperm and eggs. And it, it, it's, a, it's a quick thought experiment to make us understand why that's relevant. That's relevant because now you can essentially place information into the human genome permanently to be inherited generation after generation. So this is been called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, this kind of reading, um, and this kind of writing um, has been called somat germline, not somatic, not, not the soma of the body, but germline gene therapy, in which case you would, in, in, you would change the genetic information in the germline. Um, and this is just to remind us that, you know, I, I, just, I, I just found this, um, found this little um, uh, snippet of a book, but this is just to remind us again that uh, we now have the capacity combining these two technologies uh, to start writing information deliberately um, and consciously into the human genome. So, so, so what have we learned um, from this reading and writing process as we move forward? Well, we've learned several things, but here's a kind of important, uh, th these, are, uh, these are some natural uh, limitations to how quickly and deeply we can intervene. The first thing we've learned is that most human traits are controlled by multiple genes. Um, most common diseases don't have a single gene. BRCA1 is maybe an exception. Cystic fibrosis is an exception. Huntington's disease is a famous exception. Um, many have, sorry, many have genetic links, but the exact genes are unknown. That's true for schizophrenia. We know schizophrenia is a genetic disease, but really most of the genes for schizophrenia are unknown. Um, there's, a, there's still a role for environment and chance here. Um, and finally, that, that when we do move forward with these, so the, the idea of a genetic report card, it'll only give us propensities and not certainties about our future risks. So these um, five principles are natural constraints as to how quickly and effectively we might wish to intervene on human genomes. Everything that we do won't have, that there'll, be, there'll, be, there'll be some natural constraints to what we can and cannot achieve. But that said, um, while all of these natural constraints are being recognized in terms of what, can, what we can do, um, we are actually moving forward with uh, making deliberate changes in the human genome. Um, this is Jennifer Doudna, um, uh, one of the scientists, there's a whole group of them, uh, who's been responsible actually to f figuring out technologies that allow us to um, essentially, and this is, a, this is obviously a graphic, but essentially uh, make, uh, make uh, deliberate changes in the human genomes. As I said, I, I used the example of a BRCA1 mutation. You could, you could essentially redirect that uh, to a change in the, in, in the human genome. The last piece of technology that comes into play here um, is that we, that would all be fine. We could read and write human genomes, but the capacity to transmit that information into sperm and eggs was missing, and 
really in the last two years, um, biologists have come upon that piece of technology as well. So we can now make changes, uh, we've learned to make changes in cells that produce sperm and eggs, and once you make the changes, if you could use um, this kind of uh, making of a change, for instance, into a mutation that causes breast cancer, you would be able, in principle, to create a sperm that now lacks that, uh, that genetic mutation, and if that sperm was to be made into an embryo, you would now eliminate that BRCA1 heritage um, forever. And that's been finally compounded by the most exciting and the most threatening idea of all, which is that we can now make entirely synthetic human genomes, or synthetic genomes, potentially from by making a chemical form of the, of the gene. Um, so the question that's on everyone's minds is, will there be designer babies? Um, well, the answer is not soon. We've, we've, we've started creating these technologies, um, but the old questions about eugenics still apply, which is that once we start entering this world, um, we will soon begin to enter a world in which our aspirations and desires as human beings will be or will not be reflected in what kind of children we have. I'm gonna end by, um, by, by pointing out the, uh, the idea that, that this the, the, we're at the edge of this precipice, and therefore uh, the questions of what to do about it have started reverberating widely around the world. And this is one example of a report, this was brought out by the National Academy of Sciences, to ask the question, should we intervene on human genomes um, in a way that allows this intervention to carry forward uh, in generation after generation? And I, I'd like to end by reading uh, this, uh, this, this point, um, which is, uh, because germline genome edits would be heritable, and now you know why, their effects could be multi-generational. As a result, both the potential benefits and potential harms could be multiplied. In addition, the notion of intentional germline genetic alteration has occasioned significant debate about the wisdom and appropriateness of this form of intervention, because these include concerns about diminishing the dignity of humans, respect for their variety, failing to appreciate the importance of the natural world, and a lack of humility about our wisdom and powers of control when altering that world or people within it. Um, and so, the shocking thing about, um, about this report, which really made people think, take, take a step back and think, was that um, they concluded that in fact, for the first time, they did think it was permissible to make germline genome edits in human sperm and eggs um, under these conditions, uh, that there'd be no other reasonable alternative, that the genes uh, result in a serious disease or condition, so-called extraordinary suffering, and that they have a strong uh, predisposition to that disease or condition. So the genie of the gene is now, uh, it, at least by, by, by this recommendation of this report, technically out of the bottle. We can now uh, uh, are allowed to consider making uh, genetic interventions in humans. Um, uh, and, and the question that I will leave us with um, is a question that I think all of us need to participate in which is, uh, what is the future of an organism that has learned to decipher the code of its own instructions? Um, that's the question implicit in the gene, um, and, and I hope that we can use uh, the book and many other books to really think about uh, what happens next. Thank you very much.